attention uh, that there will be some photographs in here that may make people uncomfortable of animals eating other animals. So do be aware if that type of thing uh, is inappropriate. Um, you know, just, just be aware if it comes up, you can uh, hide your screen or look away. Nothing terribly grisly, but it is Halloween. So we are going to try to keep things a little edgy. So to start out, um, oh, I'm gonna, I, also a little bit about my work with Alachua Audubon. Um, I am managing a native plant garden for Alachua Audubon and working with uh, a lot of uh, students at UF uh, on uh, some of the native plant uh, identity, identification and their interaction with birds. I'm also an Eagle Watch participant and will be a CLI mentor uh, this year for Alachua Audubon. So I will be at Audubon Assembly next week. So if you see me and have any bug questions or bat questions, please come up and talk to me. So with that, we will get going. Okay, um, most people have innate fears. Uh, the great apes are scared of spiders and snakes. So a lot of the things that we're scared of, we come by naturally to some extent. For, as far as invertebrates go, spiders are number one on the list. A lot of people freak out uh, when they see roaches and scorpions also make people uncomfortable. Uh, for vertebrates, bats are number one, but snakes are a close number two, and then rodents. But really, there are things to be scared of that are not on this list. So it kind of gives us an idea how, of how our interpretation of what to be afraid of is a little bit skewed by what society has taught us. The most dangerous creatures that we interact with probably on almost a daily basis include dogs. Um, dogs kill a lot more people than snakes and bears and everything else combined. Um, rabies is also an issue with dogs. There's about 60,000 deaths every year, mostly unfortunately in third world countries from rabies. Um, that will give you nightmares the next time you see a nasty pit bull walking down the street who is questionable as far as their vaccinations go. But rabies is a, a, a horrible disease and probably one of the bigger uh, killers of people in third world countries. The other creature uh, is the number one killer of humans in the entire world and that is the mosquito. Now, there's a number of different mosquitoes out there. They vector yellow fever, malaria, dengue, um, uh, some of the other um, diseases that we've run into here in Florida actually recently. And about 700,000 people a year die of malaria or malaria-related diseases and mosquito other diseases that are vectored by mosquitoes. So things that are in our lives that we take for granted are generally not a threat or really some of the more dangerous things that we run into. So um, next time you see a dog, uh, let think about that and keep your pets vaccinated. Um, spiders are also very high on the list. We do have some venomous spiders in Florida, and I know they give a lot of people the creeps, but uh, in general, spider bites really aren't as bad as what people think they are. They're grossly overreported in the medical community. Um, any unknown infection site is often like tagged as a spider bite, um, which is really doing a disservice uh, to spiders because in most cases, spider bites don't become infected. Um, they don't cause any problem. We do have the widow spiders. There's three species in Florida, two of which are native, which is the black and the brown widow. Um, they do have a neurotoxin that can cause short-term neurological issues and um, headaches and uh, you know, night sweats and things like that, but they very rarely kill people. We also have recluse spiders. Now, brown recluse spiders are not native to Florida. Really, we have no native recluse spiders. They are very rarely found, but they're often blamed for every oddball infection and uh, skin pimple that shows up on patients in emergency rooms and doctor's offices. But recluse bites um, are really unusual in this part of the country. Uh, there is a recently introduced recluse, which is this guy here. That's the Chilean recluse. That's a nasty one. Um, if you get bitten by them, their venom is um, 
enzymatic, so you end up with a nice festering, ulcerating sore that uh, can be very difficult to treat. So that one has been found in a couple of counties in South Florida. They don't think it's established, but that's one to be scared of. Um, if you ever run into these little bumpy things in a spider web, that is an egg case that's associated with the widow spiders. All of them make a very similar egg case. So if you see these, just simply sweep them up and destroy them and carry on because that spider is probably hiding and trying to get away from you. We also have a number of scorpions in Florida. Um, the Florida bark scorpion is one that you're probably most likely to encounter uh, digging around in the mulch or moving boards or um, you know, running around outside somewhere. They do live under bark, which is why they're named that way. And uh, they carry their babies on their backs. They're very maternal. Um, they're one of the few arthropods that uh, exhibits maternal care. And this is about how big they are. Most of these scorpions, the biggest ones are three or four inches long. Uh, the stings of the Florida bark scorpion, which is actually not native to Florida, it is misnamed. And the hen's striped scorpion are pretty minor unless you have an allergic reaction to them, which most, pe most people don't. It's kind of like a bee sting. If you're a gardener or out in the woods a lot, you've probably run into these one time or another. Um, if you do have them in your neighborhood, and I have seen them before. It's always a good idea to check your boots before you put them on if you've had them out on the garage or in the back porch because that's how most people get stung. Um, the Guiana striped scorpion is one that uh, has been uh, introduced to Florida and it's kind of nasty. It's uh, present more in South Florida and in the Keys. It has a uh, more severe sting and certainly can cause some secondary symptoms. But again, it's not deadly like some of the uh, scorpions in the southwestern United States are. One thing that's rather eerie about scorpions is they fluoresce under black light. So um, if you want to go and dig out your black light posters or go to your nearest head shop and buy a black light, you can wander around in the woods and fluoresce scorpions. And something else that might give you the creeps is the fact that ticks also fluoresce. So if you've been out roaming around in the woods and think you may have ticks on you, um, get your black light out, strip down, and have your partner do a good check. You may see more than you want to see, but you will also see glowing ticks if they're present. Um, this critter, the blood-sucking cone nose, sounds like something that was made up in Hollywood, but it is a legitimate dangerous animal that we run into in Florida periodically. It is an assassin bug. Um, probably most of you have seen the wheel bug. It's this critter right here. That is also an assassin bug. It's a predaceous insect that flies. Now these are diurnal, meaning they're out during the day, the, the wheel bugs, but the uh, Kissing bug or blood sucking cone nose is another nighttime creeper. And what these things do is they come out of hiding and they bite you in soft places like your eyelids, around your lips, which gives them the name kissing bugs, uh, and mucous membranes in the nose and the ears and all the tender places that are easy to suck blood out of. Now, um, this creature also. Uh, carries a disease called Chagas disease. And it's a trypanosome, which means it's a parasite similar to the parasite that uh, is caused that causes malaria, except it doesn't in, infest the blood cells, but it does get into the body. And initially, um, you'll see swelling and irritation at the site of the bite. And then that kind of goes away. But this parasite then works its way into your body and uh, infects uh, internal organs, joints, uh, the nervous system, and can ultimately be fatal. Um, it is present in the uh, Central and South America, and cases have been found in the Southern United States, including Florida. Uh, there were some studies that were done on kissing bugs that were collected in South Florida, and 30% of them carried uh, the parasite that causes Chagas disease. And I've seen people with symptoms of Chagas disease in South Florida. This is one that's just waiting to explode, I think. Um, some particularly disheartening things about this horrible creature is that they are associated with rodents. Uh, the only place I've seen them in the wild has been in squirrel nests. And when I was in the pest control business, 
we would occasionally have to remove squirrel nests from attics and soffits and places like that. And every once in a while, we would see these lovely blood-sucking code noses in there feeding on the squirrels. Um, so they are associated with human habitation with rodent nests. And then the other pleasant thing about them is um, their feces are actually what infects you. They bite you. And uh, as they're feeding, they defecate. And when you scratch the injury, either through irritation or after it starts swelling, it begins to uh, become itchy. You scratch their feces into your wound. So that is the form of infection. Now, if that doesn't scare you, not much else will. We also have some moths uh, that are kind of in the lore of frightening creatures. The first one is the death's head moth. Now this one's in the sphinx moth family. Uh, their uh, larvae look like tomato hornworms and all of those uh, nice big fat juicy caterpillars that are uh, all over your tomatoes and pentas and plants like that. Um, there are three different species of death's head moth, but you can see why they're called that. They have very distinct markings on their thorax. It kind of looks like a skull. Now to a predator, that looks like the face of maybe some nasty animal. So they uh, are trying to scare away things that are trying to eat them. But um, of course, Hollywood uh, used this in the Silence of the Lambs as a symbol of um, some of the uh, horrible things that Hannibal Lecter was doing. And so this moth actually became very famous. In folklore, it is considered to be a, um, the appearance of that is a sign that someone you love is going to die. So if you see one, please be aware that, uh, you know, there is that association. Now, this is not a, uh, an insect that we find in North America. It is mostly European and Northern African, but you never know when one of these may cross your doorstep. We also have a lovely moth called a black witch. And I just saw one of these on the outside of my house not long ago. They are um, a large, one of the largest moths that we have in Florida. And um, this moth uh, has a good reputation. It carries the souls of your beloved people that have passed on on their wings. And when you see one, someone that loves you who's dead is coming to visit. So this moth is bringing us messages from the great beyond. Now we also have creepy birds. But most of us uh, probably have a little different attitudes about some of these, but there's lots of interesting uh, legends about some of the birds that cry at night. And that in itself is scary because you can't see what it is, but something's making this weird noise as everybody's heard um, some of the owls, uh, particularly some of the, the screech owls that uh, just are very eerie sounding. But uh, traditionally, owls were thought to be messengers from witches or for witches, as they were in the Harry Potter movies, but that was a little more benign uh, representation of them. They are also omens of death. And I thought this one was very interesting. When you hear an owl hoot in near a house, uh, that is supposed to be an indication that a young woman in the vicinity has lost her virginity. So the owls tell tales. Uh, so keep an eye on your daughters if you hear those owls hooting. Uh, the common loon has a, a very haunting call. If anyone's heard that, it, uh, it stays with you. Um, they are also considered to be a harbinger of death in some cultures. Uh, and uh, they think that the loon call was also the origination of the werewolf howl because of the, the warbling there. Um, night jars are an interesting group of birds. That's the whippoorwills and uh, night hawks and that, that group. Um, some people call them goat suckers because they were thought to steal milk from livestock. And I think probably that started because they uh, swoop around livestock trying to catch insects. They are not sucking goat tits, but uh, that is one of the uh, legends about them uh, from uh, the Middle East. Now, speaking of birds, there is a spider that eat birds, that eats birds. This is the largest spider. It's in the tarantula family. Um, they are absolutely massive. Um, and people uh, eat these. They are considered to be a delicacy. But this is a spider that chows down on birds. Uh, they also eat lizards and uh, frogs, but they are a vertebrate eater. 
And there's something about watching an invertebrate eat a vertebrate that gives a lot of people the willies. So the next pictures are going to be about that. So if that makes you uncomfortable, you probably want to close your eyes and let your imagination work for you in the dark. So here we have spiders feeding on vertebrates. Um, we have one of the giant orb weavers feeding on a bat. Here's another one eating a bat. And now we, that is a um, wolf spider chowing down on a frog. And then this little guy here, if you can see it, this is actually from a pond on our property. This is one of the fishing spiders. And uh, these spiders capture fish. That's a little baby fishing spider feeding on a gambusia or a, a young mosquito fish. So spiders feed on vertebrates just like they do invertebrates. Whoop, went the wrong way there. Um, they uh, inject a venom that liquefies the, uh, the, the prey's innards and they just kind of suck them dry and drop the dry husks to the ground. So that is one of the origins of the uh, vampire legend, uh, some people believe, because they would suck people, the vampires would suck people dry and leave their bodies behind. So we segued into bats here. So we're going to talk a little bit about bats in the food chain. Um, we have fishing bats um, that uh, actually take those long toes and drag them through the water and snatch up fish and they eat them on the fly. Because remember, bats can't perch. They can only hang upside down. So these guys grab those little fish, fly off and chow down on them as they're uh, cruising back to their home roost. Um, here's an owl eating a bat. And we have an egret eating a bat there. And now we have a bat eating a bird. So the circle of life continues um, with predator eating other predators. Now bats, um, we're going to talk, we're moving into bats, obviously, and this will be a, kind of the finale. Are, they're an incredibly diverse group of animals. Um, some people call them sky puppies or cloud bears. I think that's just a branding, a rebranding opportunity, but, you know, more power to them if they can get people to think about them differently because bats are maligned globally. Um, they're actually the second largest order of mammals after the rodents. There's 1,400 species. And the bats that we have here in North America are the micro bats. These are the little guys that eat insects and they use echolocation. The big spooky bats that a lot of people are afraid of are fruit eaters or uh, nectar feeders. They're the mega bats, the flying foxes. It's thought the micro bats actually uh, evolved from the rodents. The mega bats evolved from the mustelids, which is the otters and um, raccoons and that uh, line. So it's kind of a parallel evolution. Bats are under the same ecological pressures that birds are, um, even more so in many cases. They are very slow to reproduce. And historically, not a lot of people have done research on bats because they're scared of them. Now, dispelling the myths. Bats are not blind. Uh, they can see very well. They just don't always use their eyes for hunting. The insect-eating bats do use echolocation. They don't get tangled in your hair. They don't attack humans unless they're vampire bats. And in vampire, with vampire bats, they will creep into your bed while you are sleeping and make a small slice in a soft part of your body and lick up your blood as it oozes out. And so that's something you do have to be aware of when you're in the tropics because they feed readily on people just like livestock. Now, bats do get rabies, but they die very, very quickly of rabies. They don't walk around slobbering and infecting people like infected dogs do. So the most common form of rabies exposures in humans and bats is people picking up downed bats. Because again, bats get sick, they're laying on the ground, people pick them up, try to nurse them back to health and become exposed. So if you do see a downed bat, put on gloves, pick it up, put it in a box and take it to a veterinarian or put it aside because you don't want to handle it. But your odds of exposure are extremely small. Um, and as I said, 90% of Rabies deaths globally are from dogs, not our little flying furry rodent friends. 
Um, infectious disease is also an issue with bats. They are good virus vectors and they have very strong immune systems. So the viruses don't affect them. Uh, bats are considered uh, a delicacy in many cultures. And we think that's where diseases um, like Ebola and possibly even uh, some of our more recent nasty viruses originated. Um, bats also vector histoplasmosis, which is a, uh, a bacterial disease that is uh, harbored in their poop. And another thing that's interesting about bats is they think that um, bed bugs originated from bat bugs, which is a, an insect that's a parasite of bats, way long time ago when the bats and the humans were cohabitating in caves. The bat bugs uh, decided that humans were softer and more delectable than their more mobile hosts, the bats, and actually evolved as a separate species to feed on humans. But we can thank bats for all of those hotel rooms that were fumigated because bed bugs moved into them. Bats eat a lot of bugs. That is their primary purpose uh, in, in most of the global bat populations, if they're not a pollinator species. Um, they eat uh, almost 100% of their body weight every night in flying arthropods and certainly aid pest control. When you know, you're in the agricultural business, you want to encourage bats. However, I'm going to burst a bubble. Bats do not like mosquitoes. Bats prefer big, juicy insects like moths and beetles and katydids and grasshoppers and uh, dragonflies. Mosquitoes are small. They're hard to track down. They don't pick up well on echolocation, and they're too much work for the energy that it takes to eat them. But that's a secret because the bat community encourages people believe, people's belief that bats eat mosquitoes because it keeps them from killing bats. It, it uh, allows people to put up bat houses, but it's kind of like the Purple Martin story. Um, Purple Martins and bats will occasionally eat mosquitoes. They are not a selected food source. So we don't want to deceive people. Um, but their, benefit, their other benefit is they pollinate many, many plant species, uh, mostly in the tropics. And their guano was used for fertilizer and gunpowder at one point because it's very high in nitrogen and is rather explosive. Now, we're going to have a little quiz here. Um, this is poop from various creatures. Um, and if you are uncertain of what is crapping in your garage or under your sink, there's some cues to this here. Um, there's a couple, a couple of things to look at. This is rodent droppings because rodents have a soft uh, sphincter. So when they poop out their um, feces, they're tapered and they kind of look familiar, um, but they stay together. Bats, on the other hand, have similar looking droppings, except when you touch them, they fall apart because they're full of little bits and pieces of insects. And if you look at these under a microscope or a magnifying glass, you can see heads and legs and antennas and all bits and pieces of all the creatures that they've been eating. But you know, side by side, if you don't start ripping apart these little turds, you will not see that. Um, now, this is caterpillar poop. And insects, because they're soft, or excuse me, because they have a hard exoskeleton, when they excrete, their droppings come out with blunt ends. And that's true for all insects. So you, if you see blunt poop under your sink versus tapered poop, you have roaches. And then finally, we have this. Now, most people in Audubon would say, oh, that's bird dung, but it's actually lizard. But birds and lizards, because of their mutual evolutionary uh, relatives, have similar excretory systems. So you see the solids here and the urea coming out in that little white thing. But that's actually lizard dung. So now you know what to look for when you see odd droppings in places you don't want to see. So what's killing bats? People uh, in all of our forms and glory. Uh, they're still greatly maligned in many areas and uh, are killed. Their roosts are destroyed. We've got white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that is absolutely obliterating 
uh, entire colonies and in some cases uh, extirpating species from areas uh, right now. And it is spread by human activity. Uh, this is a crisis in the bat world. Um, if you're keeping up in any sort of biology, you probably heard about this and it is heartbreaking. But, you know, there's people putting a lot of effort into it. Um, wind energy is another really controversial area because bats, it's been shown, are actually attracted to the sounds made by turbines. And on a one-to-one -one basis, there are more bats killed uh, by turbines uh, than there are birds, and there are a lot less bats out there. Now, each death is a tragedy, obviously, but um, they're trying to do some work to see if they can reduce the uh, sound waves made by the turbines in different, uh, with different configurations, but obviously that takes money, and right now nobody cares. So this is really a kind of a, a, a sad thing that's going on. And climate change, because bats, unlike birds, typically don't migrate much. They migrate much. They hibernate. And um, as winters get warmer or there's warm spells, it disrupts their hibernation, causes them to burn energy, and uh, they won't make it through hibernation, which is also one of the things mm -hmm. associated with white nose syndrome, because uh, white nose syndrome disrupts bats' hibernation, and they burn their fat stores and also essentially starve or freeze to death. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the bat world. Um, now a good story. You have bat houses. If you've ever been to the University of Florida, um, I would highly recommend you go see the bat houses. They're near Lake Alice. Um, you can find them on any UF map. I was lucky enough to be part of the uh, group that did that put together the very first bat houses. A large building that burned down in 1987 on campus. We knew there was a big old bat colony in there and we didn't know where they went. Um, so we just, you know, kind of waited to see what happened. There's bats all over campus, but they usually keep a pretty low profile. And we, the people in pest control, only had to deal with them when they occasionally stumbled into a classroom and terrified all of the students. However, in, in 1989, the track, track, track and field stadium was renovated. And uh, Governor yeah. Bob Martinez visited with his entourage. Um, and if you remember Bob Martinez, if you were in Florida at the time, I think that's where Governor DeSantis got his uh, start. He is, he is modeling Martinez at a more extreme level. But anyway, um, as the governor and his people were leaving the stadium, the bats who were living in the stadium bleachers, which we didn't know about, went out for their evening feeding. Now bats, when they go out to feed, they lighten their load. And the entire group of dignitaries from Tallahassee were shat and pissed upon by about a thousand bats. And it caused a lot of problems. So I got a call from the director of athletics, um, who at the time was Jeremy Foley. I got to meet with him. And lo and behold, money appeared to do a bat uh, elimination from the stadium, a, an appropriate mm -hmm. bat elimination, and also to build bat houses. So in 1981, the first bat house was completed. We had occupancy on and off by a few bats. We did a lot of exclusion projects. And by the way, when I say we, I actually left in 1990 and my predecessor, bless his heart, took this uh, project to heart and did, did a wonderful job with it. By 1995, five years after the bat house was first built, we had a breeding colony of non-migratory bats. They were um, southeastern brown bats and free tail bats. Um, this is Johnson Hall, the building that burned down. Um, this is the track and field stadium. And these are the bleachers. And those little gaps in there were about three quarters of an inch wide. And all of that stuff there was all of the poop and urine and everything else that was draining down from underneath those uh, uh, bleachers. That's where the bat colony was. Um, the exclusion that was done by a bunch of professionals, they put up one-way netting where the bats could get out, but they couldn't get back in. And they also used some tubes. We had to be careful when we did this because bats leave their young back at the maternal roost when they go out to feed. So we did not want to exclude mama bats from getting back to their babies. So we waited until all the babies had fledged and then started this project. Um, this, the picture in the background is uh, from inside of the bat house. Um, this is the second bat house at the University of Florida and all of these bats are hanging on netting uh, there. Um, the second bat house was built in 2010. 
Um, they put in another bat, a bat house in 2017, but there were some issues with it. The bats didn't move into it. In 2022, the bat, the third bat barn was modified. Um, and luckily that worked because the first bat house started to collapse and was actually taken down prior to Hurricane Ian. So right now we've got about uh, half a million bats at the University of Florida bat house. And um, this is uh, a picture of what the bat house looks like from underneath. And all of those are just little fins in there that the bats squeeze up in there. And um, that's where they roost. And uh, if you go there in the evenings, you can watch me merge. And one thing, one thing to keep in mind is that there are predators of these bats. There are several red shoulder hawks that are there every single night, snatching bats out of the air and making meals of them. We also have snakes that regularly climb these, rather, even though we try to keep them out. Um, yellow rat snakes and the red rats get up there and they eat the bats. And then there's also a number of predators that hang around underneath the bat house because occasionally the little bats drop out and they get gobbled up by all of the all of the other creatures that are living underneath. But that is all part of the cycle of life. So as I said, UF has the largest occupied bat house that was made for bats um, in the whole world. Um, and these guys, it's estimated this single bat colony uh, consumes about 2,500 pounds of bugs every single night. So, and this is a lovely long-eared bat. Isn't that an elegant looking animal? I don't think anyone would think that's scary. Do you? There's also some big bat houses in Florida. Um, this one is on Sugarloaf Key, and I think it's still there. I don't think the Oldsmar one still stands. If anyone has been there, you can tell me at assembly if you've seen them. But um, these were built because people thought the bats would eat their mosquitoes, and we'll let them continue to think that because it keeps them from hurting the bats. And you can put a bat house in your backyard as well. I have one that was doing really, really well until uh, I had a red-bellied woodpecker attack it and poke holes in it, and the bats all moved out. So if you're interested in learning more about bats, Bat Conservation International is a wonderful advocacy group. It's kind of the parallel to Audubon um, for the bat world. Um, they've got a wonderful website, lots of resources on building bat houses, how to make your yard bat friendly. The Florida Bat Conservancy is a local group that does um, bat education. They work with the pest control industry and builders in uh, helping uh, remove bats from places they don't want them to be. And then the Florida Museum of Natural History has a bat house page that you can go to. So um, I'll leave this up for a couple of minutes if you want to take a picture of this with your cell phone. And uh, if not, I can give you this information um, at a later date. But these are, uh, or and this, this will be, I guess, available on YouTube as well. Um, but um, there's a lot of bat resources out there. And remember, everything that you do to make habitat better for birds, you are doing the same for bats because... They're, they overlap very much in their behavior and their activities and their environment. Just one does it during the day and the other one does it at night. So thank you all very much. Um, I have photo credits down here, but I also lifted a lot of stuff off Wikipedia. So that's the way it goes. And with that, um, I would like to thank you. And uh, Deborah, if you have any questions from the group, I'm uh, willing to address those now. So you all have okay. a spooky evening. Thank you so much, Ali. Okay, let's see. Somebody asked, can you talk about chiggers? They're also infected in Asian India, which is causing poor. Oh yeah, chiggers are actually parasites of primarily of squirrels. And um, the legend goes that you get chiggers from Spanish moss. Yes. Um, but actually Spanish moss lives in oak trees. Oak trees make acorns, squirrels eat acorns. So that's the association. The chiggers are just there hanging out waiting for squirrels. They don't reproduce on humans. In fact, by the time they are itching, they've already fed, injected their uh, uh, saliva that makes you swell and itch and ooze blood, and they've dropped off and moved on. So um, putting fingernail polish on them does no good, but it may make you feel better. So if there's a placebo effect, that's good but um, they are not human feeders by choice. 
Uh, they just kind of incidentally show up. But that's why Spanish moss is associated with chiggers. Okay. Um, so we just did that one. Um, and let's see. What are the questions that we have? Um, Alan wondered if we should build a big bat house uh, down here, like um, perhaps in the Lake Popka uh, drive area. Oh, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I know y'all got plenty of money to do it. Yeah. Okay. Do bats eat butterflies or other important pollinators? Um, no, because the butterflies are flying around in the day, but they eat moths. And moths are pollinators. And yes, certainly. They do not discriminate between a moth. Well, and keep in mind that adult moths are pollinators. <clears throat> the moths' caterpillars eat your corn and your collards and your marigolds and your tomatoes. So um, yes, they are non-discriminatory. They will eat moths. And if they come upon a migrating butterfly at night, they probably would eat that as well. But they really like beetles. That's kind of their first choice. Really? Beetles have a lot of fat in them. And a lot of insects fly at night because most of their predators, birds and lizards and uh, dragonflies and, and you know things like that are out during the day. So bats are kind of the only night flyers along with some of the nocturnal birds that actually eat um, insects at night. But that's why a lot of them are out at night. If something's eating your plants at night or you've got carpenter ants, excuse me, carpenter ants coming in your house and you don't know where they're from, go out at night because a lot of those bugs are out because the lizards are all asleep. And I don't know if you have time to think of this, but what, what scary experiences with bugs have you had? Um, ticks. Um, I, you know, I am knowledgeable of ticks. I also know how nasty they are and I didn't include them in this talk, but they, you know how we talked about the blood sucking cone noses and how their feces actually transmit the diseases. It's kind of how ticks are, except the ticks anal opening is right next to their mouth. So they excrete whatever is in their gut as they're feeding on you, which is a pleasant thought. Um, but my husband and I were out uh, hiking one day and, uh, you know, in, in an area where there's deer and everything else and got back in our car, started driving home and looked down and we were absolutely swarmed by newly hatched ticks or uh, larvae. Uh, they call them seed ticks. And we stepped out of our vehicle on the side of the road, took off our clothes, threw them in a ditch, and drove home half naked because they were everywhere. Oh, uh -huh. It was just horrid. Um, and even though intellectually I know that ticks are, you know, no different than anything else, they give me the creeps because they transmit mm -hmm. so many diseases. Uh -huh. and, uh, they, are, they are wicked and their populations are increasing. Their invasiveness is increasing. Um, and we're increasing interaction with them because there are more and more people moving into deer and wildlife habitats where the, the ticks have always been. So ticks still give me the creeps. I, you know, I handle them. I'm not scared of them, but I just shudder when I find one on me. Uh huh. Drew said he had a, she had a similar experience. Um, okay. Susan is asking, she says, I normally have small bats in my yard, but the other evening I saw some several very large bats in the neighborhood. Are these migrants? Uh, it could be. Um, we do have a uh, Seminole bat is the biggest bat that we have in Florida. And they like to nest in um, palm fronds. And so you could have, there could have been Seminole bats there. Um, they're not truly migratory. Um, most of the Florida bats are here year round. Um, they don't do cross, uh, cross the Gulf migrations or anything like, like a lot of warbler species or anything. So you probably just got some visitors um, from another area that you normally don't see. They could have been, uh, like I said, Seminole bats, maybe gray bats, or um, one of the big brown bats. We have a few big brown bats. But it's it's great that you could even tell the difference in size. So most people don't observe that. So good for you. And Dusty said that certain bats are pollinators. Are, are, you mentioned that was mostly tropical. Are, are you aware of any locally? No, none of the North American bats are pollinators except a few species that come up into uh, Texas and Arizona from Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, now, they will occasionally spread pollen from one plant to another just through their um, habits of feeding around plants that are blooming at night. But no, there are not any nectar feeding bats that are uh, in our part of North America. 
but the um, uh, one of the most common plants that uh, bats pollinate is actually agave, which uh, is tequila is made out of. And um, if you're familiar with uh, um, the Luby Bat Foundation, uh, there's a there's a, a rescue or a, a what I'm trying to say this. There's a bat organization here in Gainesville that uh, keeps flying foxes and does a lot of con conservation work for the big fruit bats. It was actually started by um, Louis Bacardi uh, of the Bacardi rum and alcohol family. And if you look at uh, the label on any Bacardi uh, product, you'll see that there's a fruit bat on the label. So the Bacardi family bequeathed money and they started the Luby Bat Found Foundation, which is Louis Bacardi, Luby, that's where that comes from. Um, oh. and they're doing a lot of concert. Well, they, they've kind of disassociated a little bit, but uh, Bacardi still donates a lot of money to bat conservation because bats are the primary pollinator of agave, which we make tequila out of. Um, and there's a lot of other tropical plants that are really dependent on bat, bats as pollinators. Bats are also the first animals to enter areas that have been clear cut or burned in the tropics because you know most animals that eat fruit that are going to defecate seeds they don't want to move out into that open area bats will fly across it and if it wasn't for bats reforestation would be extremely low in a lot of areas where we're trying to fight clear cutting and all of the damage that humans are doing because they're the first creatures to fly across there and poop out a bunch of good healthy seeds Wow, that is really interesting. You had a scary story about a governor or something like that? Yes, uh, that, that was the governor of um, Florida, Bob Martinez in 1989, who got pooped on all by all of the bats who um, flew out of the stadium. Um, and that's, you know, they were terrified. They were running for cover. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, that, that's kind of what triggered the whole cascade of events that eventually uh, resulted in the bat houses, which is now the number one tourist attraction at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anyone else have a question? This has been really enlightening. I, I love the thing about the fluorescent black lights showing ticks. Yeah, you may see more than you want to see, but like I said. <laughs> and also uh, semen, urine, and blood fluorescent black light. So be careful where you shine it. Well, we've got a couple uh, comments. Excellent talk. I'm sorry you can't see these comments. Um, That's why I wish I could see my audience. I don't like doing this. I, I tell you, the scariest thing I did, Deborah, is learning to do this uh, technology. Zoom was challenging. I got that one down and this is a whole new one. Street art. So uh, that was the scariest part of my day is uh, getting through this and we made it. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. And thanks everybody for coming. This will be posted on YouTube and you can look at it later. Uh, other people can look at it. Um, so we will say good night and thank you once again, Lee. Oh, let me put your, um, your email up and in case oh, yeah. it has to contact. Please go ahead. And, you know, I hopefully I'll see some folks at um, assembly next week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, please, please come up and talk to me. It'd be nice to see your faces. Okay. So we're done. We are done. Good night, everybody. I'm going to end. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. <laughs>